The U.S. Department of Energy is cleaning up the Oak Ridge Reservation of residual hazardous and radioactive contamination left over as a result of decades of nuclear energy research. Much of that work has been influenced by the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup operations. You're welcome to attend the meetings and be part of this important work. Good evening, everyone. Um, I know we've got several online, but we're going to go ahead and get our meeting started. I want to welcome everybody this evening and appreciate all those that are in person and those that have joined us online. Um, the first thing that I'd like to do is turn the meeting over to uh, Ms. Melissa Knoll so she can introduce our new members. Good evening. Uh, thank you, as always, for being here and your commitment to the board. Uh, we really appreciate you being here for Valentine's Day. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to recognize our newest members. Um, we have uh, five new members, but I'm only going to introduce one tonight because the rest of them couldn't make it tonight. So we have Charles Moore. He's sitting at the corner of the table. He is a source house technician with Miriam Technologies and is pursuing a degree in chemistry with Run State Community College, and he lives in Knoxville. So I will hold the rest of the uh, introductions to next night. Um, I would also like to introduce a, you a new member of our leadership team who is here tonight, and that's uh, Eric Olds. Eric began serving as our deputy manager a couple of weeks ago. He comes to us by way of Hanford and headquarters, and we're very excited to add his experience and skills to the team. He has worked exclusively with, uh, extensively, excuse me, with boards across the EM complex in his previous roles. So this will be a great addition for us, and we know that you'll enjoy working with him. I will now turn it over to Eric for updates to the program. Probably exclusively too. So I think both of those were, were actually very accurate. Good evening. Uh, thank you all. I'm really happy to be here tonight. And I did wear a pink tie in honor of Valentine's Day. So thank just trying to get everyone into the spirit just when they get it. So um, welcome, Charles. Fantastic to have you here. So before I get started on some other updates, let me give one more personnel related update on our leadership team. Uh, Laura Wilkerson, who many of you may have known as, as the deputy, um, has been selected to serve as Oak Ridge's chief engineer on the environmental management side. So in her position, we'll be leaning pretty heavily on Laura using her, her extensive engineering and, and technical background to tackle some of our, our bigger challenges out at the site. So I um, want to give a congratulations to Laura as well as part of my updates. Um, I have several updates for you tonight, and and mind you, I'm fairly new to this as well. So <laughs> I'm going to um, please please do mind my my don't mind my thirty thousand foot level understanding of some of these things as I get more up to speed on the activities that are happening at Oak Ridge. But it, I'll, I'll just say it's really gratifying to be here because, um, as Melissa said, I spent a lot of my time in the field. Um, mostly at Hanford, but I've been all over the complex working at Rocky Flats in Nevada and, uh, and various sites. Um, spent the last two years in Washington, D.C. at EM's headquarters, and it really provided a fantastic opportunity to see the entire EM complex and really to be able to focus on sites like Oak Ridge. And arguably, I did not know as much about Oak Ridge in, until I spent time at headquarters. And... And what an amazing site, I must say. I mean, I I want to be careful not to compare Oak Ridge to other sites that I've been to, but believe me, they're not all the same. Um, and it and obviously they're all different culturally and with different challenges and different um, um, different missions for for their cleanup. But there is really something really kind of amazing, I think, about Oak Ridge and the way I looked at it from a headquarters perspective. You know, for cleanup to really be the most successful, um, you really need a combination of things that all work in, in harmony. And it, it's not just having a vision for what you want to accomplish. It's having a vision that, that people are all aligned with. And so Oak Ridge is, is really an interesting place where good work gets done, meaningful work, risk reduction, good work that, that is really noticed across the complex. But more than that, there's there's a good group of regulators, community members, stakeholders, others. I mean, it could list all, all of the groups, but really aligned on accomplishing that mission. And that's not to say that people don't have differences of opinion about exactly how you get to that end point and how you achieve that vision. 
But the fact that people are aligned on that vision and want to accomplish it together is is pretty fantastic. So I I find that pretty incredible looking looking at Oak Ridge and now being here and being able to experience that. I'm really looking forward to being part of the team and and helping out make more progress. So speaking of progress, I'll say that uh, headquarters where I did just come from has has released its top priorities for 2024. This is an annual exercise that EM does. It's it's a rather longish list of cleanup priorities across the complex. And I'm proud to say that Oak Ridge actually has three items on the list. <clears throat> the first of those is processing 35 canisters of uh, U233 as part of the U233 disposition project. And uh, of course that ensures that we continue to make steady progress on what is considered our highest priority. And that is noticed as a high priority at headquarters um, at ORNL. Uh, the second is completing soil remediation at uh, ETTP. And I do find the, the library and the lingo that you have to learn here fascinating. I thought I knew much of it from headquarters, but as I'm finding, I still have many things to learn here. But the second one is completing soil remediation at uh, East Tennessee Technology Park. And of course, that's important because that wrapped up a pretty major chapter of cleanup and allows us to begin the next phase of cleanup, which of course is going to be groundwater. Um, and the third item on the list is beginning demolition of the Alpha 2 facility at Y12. And of course, interesting, that is uh, our first demolition of a former enri enrichment um, building at that site. I'm going to visit that site, I understand shortly, I think with just a little bit more training than maybe I've had recently. So as soon as I get all of my qualifications, I'm looking forward to actually stepping foot on that site. I understand it's, it's going to be a very interesting um, demolition project. Um, as a matter of fact, we already have an update on U233. I know that Isotech is in the second phase of their processing um, activity there, and they're getting into the material that actually has higher radiological doses. Uh, but as part of the update that we have with our headquarters um, today, I, I did hear that I believe we're about halfway through processing those 35 canisters. I believe the number today is 17 or already complete. So a little bit of good pro progress to already, already report. So uh, the next one is uh, something that I actually got to see from a Hanford and a headquarters perspective. So recently, DOE um, partnered with a private company called Xeno Power, and that partnership was actually more than than Xeno. It, it involved the Department of Defense and NASA, and Xeno is a company that's actually taking uh, radiological material. They're creating power sources for um, very specific environments. In this case, they're looking at space and and deep sea applications, which is really interesting. And so through that partnership, we were actually able to transfer an old generator that contains some very highly radioactive mater material, um, in this case, strontium. And Xeno is actually going to turn those into basically power sources for these space and deep sea applications. And if successful, um, they would like to build a lot more of this, I think, for the Department of Defense and possibly um, NASA. But really, the good news is, is this is material that would have been stored on site for probably a long time. And I believe it was about 500,000 curies of material, which is quite a bit. So it's, it's nice when you get that convergence of risk reduction, um, avoiding having to store material and then ultimately dispose of it for a long time and actually get beneficial reuse out of it. I think that's pretty exciting when you get to check all of those boxes in one action. So it's a very exciting activity. Um, also, speaking of transfers, um, we recently completed our largest land transfer to date at ETEP, which is a 365-acre parcel um, known as the former powerhouse area. And again, this is really exci an exciting thing. I was just talking about Oak Ridge and my perspective um, from headquarters. You know, a lot of sites now are just starting to look at how they go through this process of turning unused or cleanup cleaned up lands over to communities and economic development entities. And it's amazing that so much of that work has been happening at Oak Ridge for so long already. In many ways, I think this site has become the model for a lot of those other sites and economic development entities to follow when transferring land for beneficial reuse. So again, it's very exciting. Um, and since our since the last meeting, um, we've tasked UCOR with completing construction of the mercury treatment facility at Y12. 
that that previous contract was expiring. And so the decision was made to go ahead and turn over the scope of work for completing that construction work to UCOR since they are going to be the operators of that facility. And I believe that is what I have for updates. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, next, we will go to uh, Mr. Petrie. I will add, it, you know, he mentioned that it was 450,000 curious. That is a, it's hard to explain how much that is. That is a huge inventory of radioactive material that is no longer in Oak Ridge. This was shipped to a facility in Pennsylvania. Um, we usually measure radioactivity in the environment in what's called peak curies. Yeah. That is 10 to the minus 12. That's 0 0.11 zeros in the other direction. Mm. This was almost five, half a million curies in that direction. This is this was a just a huge reduction in our inventory, and it, it it goes to show that and we didn't really have to pay for much of it. This is the Zeno paid for a lot of it. So these partnerships are extremely important to them and being able to get rid of it's you know stuff that we've had just sort of sitting around like what are we going to do it and then somebody says I want it. so anyway. All right, I'm done. That's great. Yeah. So, so where do y'all go put it in the space where y'all were storing that? It wasn't much of a spot. I can say that. It, it was exactly. Here's the thing. It, 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 goes, it, it goes to a lot of what we've talked about at Ornell. At Ornell, we don't have really big things, but the little things we have are really can be a real problem. Uh, we, I think we've talked about the 3026 hot cell and the problem they had there was a piece of wire about that long. Yeah. That was so hot. I mean, we it took us months to figure out how to get rid of a piece of wire. But you know, so here's here's a an RTG that was has been sitting out there for 30 years cooling off, so to speak. And uh, somebody just came in and said, We want that. It's like you can have it. Yeah. Thank you. Curious question. How did they know you had it? Do you advertise uh, anybody <laughs> want this stuff? We will start oh, say, Shelly, there's a link. If you, there was actually an article in the New Sentinel. There were three graduates from uh, Vanderbilt who started this company. What? And shortly after they started this company, they took a tour out at ORNL. Oh. And on their tour, somebody said, Oh, that that's an RTG that's just sitting there cooling off. Okay. They they saw an opportunity and they sort of got their heads together and said, Hey, here's something that, you know, the government doesn't want it. And well, this part of the government doesn't want it. And we have figured out a way to take what's in it and make something the government does want and will pay us for. Yeah. So it just, it worked out really well. That's amazing. That is, yeah. that's a nice story. Sorry, get this. Have no comments uh, other than saying what a pleasure to see you guys again. It's been a long time. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's good to have you back. Yeah. Um, next, we will have the introduction of our um, presenter for the evening. Dennis Maiden. Uh, Dennis is the senior project manager for the proposed new environmental management disposal facility landfill and existing landfills for the Oak Ridge Environmental Management Office. Previously, he was program manager for the groundwater project. He's been with DOE since 2015. We will turn the meeting over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me here again tonight. I think it was about a year ago, gave the yes. same presentation. So members that were here before, you'll see several slides that probably familiar, but for the new members, this will all be new. Of course, I'll provide updates based on what's occurred since last year. And, you know, I guess in the spirit of being Valentine's Day, I'll say, you know, I'd love to have an opportunity to give you the
Okay, so Oak Ridge Office of Environmental Management or ORM operates four active landfills uh, at the Oak Ridge site uh, where we dispose of our remediation waste, our demolition debris, and our sanitary waste that meets the waste acceptance criteria for our various landfills. Of the four, four of them, uh, landfill four, five, and seven are all permitted by the Tennessee Division of Solid Waste. And then the fourth one is a circle of landfill that's over, overseen by EPA and TDEC. Uh, we, we call that one the Marvel Management Waste Management Facility, or short for MWOF. Uh, that particular landfill is about 85% full, and so that's why we're in the process of needing to build, construct the new one, and that will be called the Environmental Management Disposal Facility, or EMDF. This diagram kind of gives you the hierarchy of how we like to try to dispose uh, of our waste and demolition debris. Of course, for sustainability purposes, we prefer not to have to dispose of anything, so we try to recycle or reuse. A good example is that is that at EMDL, where we've uh, had to uh, remove part of Bear Creek Road, some of the asphalt road, we're re reusing the asphalt, so it'll be used at other sites. Electrical wires, electrical cable, a lot of that oftentimes have been hanging over, so we're able to save that and be recycle that, so that's a good example there. For the sanitary and the bridge landfills, uh, landfill four, that's used for classified waste. That's a fairly small landfill. It's only capable of holding 35,000 cubic yards. Uh, but we have a special one for that just because of all the, the security that has to go in for a classified landfill for, for in the future. So we use that one for the uh, sanitary materials and construction debris at landfill four. That particular landfill has been in operation since 1989. It's currently about 54% full. Uh, landfill five is for sanitary uh, waste. We also take waste from the Bridge National Laboratory from their office waste, their a cafeteria waste. That particular landfill went completely built out and full will hold about 2.2 million cubic yards. Uh, it was first started receiving waste back in 1994 and it's about 55% full now. Landfill seven is uh, again the construction demolition debris. We it first went into operation back in 2001 and it's currently about 43% full. Uh, then the next level, we use our circle landfills, and that's for our low-level radiological or chemical contaminated soil. Uh, full capacity for that landfill would be 2.3 million cubic yards. It went into operation back in 2000. It's about 85% full now. And so since, since we're getting full, that's why we're, again, working with EMDF. The planned capacity is about 2.2 million cubic yards for EMDF, but it won't be operational until near the end of this decade. And of course, there's some items that just doesn't meet any of this weight, the, the whack for these landfills, and those have to be shipped off-site, mainly out of west. And you, thank you. So again, these charts show you kind of how much of our waste stays on site or on site landfills on the left. Uh, the majority by volume actually stays on site, and that's because most of it's like concrete, steel, that type of debris, and our soil remediation. Uh, so you know, greater than about or about 10%, a little less than 10% actually goes off site, but that part that goes off site is is there a high radiological activity, as Roger mentioned about you know, that takes into account some of the items that gets used reused by the most of you are probably well aware of the, the layout of the Oak Ridge site, but it's about 33,000 uh, acres. On the west side is the East Tennessee Technology Park or Heritage Center. That was the location where Orion started first doing uh, cleanup at the site and we're removing a lot of our demolition buildings. Uh, down to the south, down there, you see Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's operated by the Office of Science that's located in Bethel Valley. Up in the northeast corner is the Y-12, which is operated by NNSA. Just to the south of the uh, Y-12 are the three permitted landfills I spoke about. And there'll be a better, bigger coming up soon to show you up close. Down Bear Creek Valley is M. Wolf, and then EMDF uh, location will be a couple of miles on down Bear Creek Valley. Uh, 
one thing that we use at the site to transport our waste to, to the landfills are some roads that we simply refer to as haul roads, but they're they are gravel roads that we're able to keep the waste off of the public highways, uh, which reduces risk it's, uh, during transportation. So this is the close up again. You can see the complex area there. Y twelve uh, landfills four, five, and seven are labeled in the green. There's also three closed landfills that's shown on the same figure one, six, and two. And then the M wolf and the MDF, so you kind of get a good idea of the size, various sizes of the landfill. Get the pointer to work here. Y'all may know, but this is actually a ridge here. This is Pine Ridge, so it actually provides a good barrier during our operations of our landfill to keep keep the sound down and visuals from from the local community. But the, the closest community to from the EMDL. Sorry. Oh, dude. It is about a mile down this way, and so so y'all know groundwater from from these landfills flows from from the center of the page here off. To the west in that direction. Hang on one sec, Dennis, and I'll. Okay. Who would know with just three buttons I can mess up and who cards the screen to go this way? There you go. <laughs> so judging. <laughs> okay, so I talked about East Tennessee Technology Park, and that's where the first uh, cleanup work really the Orium started with was out there. I really like this photo. The top left shows you ETTB before we started the demolition of the buildings. And of course, the bottom right one shows uh, the completion back in 2020 when we uh, completed removal of all the buildings. Uh, at the site, you know, as Eric mentioned earlier, we still have the, uh, the soil remediation, the groundwater work that's going on out there. But you know, anyone that knows in East Tennessee that uh, flat land is is at a prime. So being able to clear this land, it's opened up and allowed a lot of opportunities for, for private industries to move in there. And I like to say that you know our own site and disposal had a big part in that because it, it's quite a more expensive, needless to say, to haul waste uh, off site out west. So you know, we were able to use those funds to continue making progress and clean down buildings. Otherwise, we've been using that for for travel costs, so it helped make this available sooner. So this is a big picture here of Elmwolf. Uh, anyone that gets to go on the uh, tour near the end of the month, you'll get to see it up close. But uh, again, it's been in operation since 2002. Um, as you can see, this is the actual landfill here. It's about 28 acres. Uh, it has six cells or compartments, and we started filling from from the east going into the other to the to the west direction here. Um, some of the support though, as you'll you'll see, there's four contact water ponds here, and they're just off the side, but there's four contact water tanks off to the side over here. These uh, tanks and ponds can hold uh, three million gallons of water, and it collects the water that hits the uh, the soil or the top of the waste, but then runs off and get gets pumped. These uh, ponds and tanks. We hold them there and we tell we sample the water and once we know that's safe to uh, discharge, we discharge it to the tributaries. Uh, but then there's the water that soaks down through the waste and becomes leachate. And we have uh, several tanks here that's capable of holding 212,000 gallons of water. That water is collected there and then uh, hauled in tanker trucks over to a wastewater treatment system where it's treated uh, before discharge. You'll see here there's a, uh, kind of a black layer, a liner cover here. We have what we call an enhanced operational cover, which is this plastic liner with a one foot play layer that directs water so it doesn't come into contact uh, with the waste. Um, currently, we have that over about half of the landfill. We typically allows us to divert about 23 million gallons of water that doesn't come into contact with the waste. So this saves a lot of treatment. And then that water goes directly straight into there. To the tributaries and the streams nearby, and then their support uh, trailers out at the site. So this is a figure that, in a report that we uh, send to the regulators each year, the uh, phase completion construct, construction completion report. But it's where we show our waste forecasts of when we think that M will, where we feel comfortable that M will be full. The bottom half of this photo, the green part, is all of the 
the waste, that volume, as you can see, it projects up in around 2029, 2030. Uh, it's before we begin where we should be nearing the film. Of, almost should be full. The yellow color here, that's actually clean fill in the landfill. During the early part, when we first started uh, putting demolition debris in the landfill, uh, you don't want to have voids and open space in the landfill, so we had to use some clean soil to uh, fill up those spaces. But now that we're into the uh, soil remediation, we're using that soil remediation to fill up those voids. And then the red line on the top of this graph, of course, is the 2.2 million cubic yards area that I talked about. And the blue is just, there's always a little bit of uncertainty on, on the volume. So that's the uncertainty calculation that we use to come up with the total. Of course, clean up and how fast you're going to fill up the landfill is always related to how much funding that we get and how much work that we're able to complete. Uh, here at Oak Ridge, we've always received uh, good funding, as you can see, since back in FY18, we received more than 600 million each year for the cleanup work. And on this graph, the blue color here is different, different funds that comes in can be used at different sites. And so the blue here is for the cleanup that we do at Y12 at ORNL. You'll see as our work has moved over in that area, we've continued to get more funds uh, to complete that cleanup. And the, the gray part in the top is the funds that we've used at ETTP. Again, you know, on FY20, we completed the demolition of the buildings, and now as we get to the soil, that number start going down. That's what you like to see is, you know, you work yourself out of the business. That makes sense. Uh, Karen Thompson, I think you all, she usually talks about the budget later in the year. She gives you a better breakout, so I'm sure she'll do that later on in the year. So again, now that we're... ETP is done and we're moving over to Y12 and RNL. These gives you photos of the buildings that are planned to be demolished out at Y12 and RNL. Uh, on the left, again, is the Y12. Although it looks there are fewer buildings at Y12, uh, there, these buildings are actually much larger than the ones over at RNL. Uh, so they're expected to take up about two thirds of the volume in our landfill. And again, RNL will be about one third of the volume to the landfill. As you can see, you know, as I talked about, these are in the valley, and then there's the ridges on the side, so there's not much open space. So again, completing the demolition of these buildings are important to free up spaces to, to build new structures in the future. Again, the, the landfill that we have is you know, important to, as I talked about, it. So anyway, I was here last year. I was talking about our two big expansion projects. One was at landfill five that, you know, the total capacity was 2.2 million, but we, we built it in phases. And so we were starting one phase of adding another 460,000 cubic yards to landfill five. Happy to say we completed that uh, before the end of the calendar year. Had good weather last year that helped us make progress. In this figure off to the right up here, you can see this is some of the soil covering part of the waste. Uh, the liner, this cover that you see here, this is actually not part of the landfill. This is just a temporary liner that we put over the, the clay so that until we start putting waste in there, as it rained on it, it wouldn't erode the clay away. There's an actual geomembrane welded layer that's down below that clay layer. Uh, EMDF, again, the chosen location and the uh, record of decision was in Bear Creek Valley. Uh, that record was signed back in September of 2022, and again, as I mentioned, we're projected to, to be completed in uh, the end of this decade. So there's a lot of things, items that goes in to ensure that our landfills are being operated uh, safely and built safely and so forth. And so this is just a diagram to give you an example. First, before we ever build one, we want to make sure that we choose a good site location. For EMDF, we installed 32 borings to collect geological data and water level and style physometers, and then an additional six borings for uh, geophysical data to check for stability of the site. Uh, then, of course, EMDF is a retrocede landfill built to those standards, so that'll go into the design while you're building it. Have QA and QC going on. At DOE, in addition to the regulators, EPA and TDEC overseeing our design and work, there's a separate body uh, called, called LFROG that 
uh, does a performance assessment before we ever get permission to build the landfill. They have to give DOE through their body approval to build it. And then before we start disposing, there's an operational thing um, that, that goes into that. Again, in site operations, we talk about waste acceptance criteria. Only certain items are allowed to go into the landfill. The projects that are doing the demolition, they do a lot of intense sampling that is reviewed before it goes into the landfills. And of course, once the landfills are are full since this is EMDL is an more for both circular projects. There'll be five year reviews that goes on forever since that waste will, will be in the landfill. And then I talked about the DOE regulatory body. There's also an annual summary report that we submit to outside of Oak Ridge that reviews the operations of the landfill. So a lot of outside eyes looking in. And then there's groundwater monitoring wells that'll monitor at the site. So for EMDF, again, Getting to get it constructed by the end of the decade, there's still several steps to go through, but uh, I talked about the DOE regulatory body of those two documents that they've given authority to, to construct it, but we have to, again, have an operational before we dispose. On the surplus side, we divided the, the construction up into several sub-projects that we refer to them. The first one was, we called it the early site prep, Bear Creek Road and Hall Road go right through the center, went through near the center where the landfill was going to be built. So we needed to move those roads to the south to open up that property. Uh, we got approval of that work plan last uh, April. We started construction on moving the roads last August, and all of that work will be completed in about two months. Another uh, item that was included in the record of decision was to form a groundwater field demonstration. Uh, that was a demonstration that DOE uh, recommended that since the regulators had concerns that the water levels may not match what was being modeled. So under this groundwater field demonstration, we're going to do some excavation at the site, put a temporary liner in there to simulate uh, how the landfill will behave once it's constructed and we'll monitor the water levels at the site for two years. Uh, we got approval for that work plan last October and construction will actually should start this coming week. We'll start the clearing out there, and that system sh should be in place by November of this year. Start the groundwater monitoring in December. Once we get all that data and fin finalize the design, there's additional you know, design that has to be approved by the regulators, and we expect that to be in 2026. And I believe this is the last slide, but. So we've had a lot of outreach with the community, of course, under surplus, part of the rod approval. There was required public comment periods. We held those back in 2015, 2018. And then with the changes, we had another meetings back in 2022. But even though once we got past the required meetings, we've held uh, several meetings with the public since then to talk about uh, the progress that we're making with the landfill. And then this past November, we ORM had one where we talked about the landfills and our other cleanup projects, and those have been well received. So I think my understanding we're going to start trying to have those about two twice a year if things don't change. So, uh, again, if you know anyone else that wants to come, those are a lot of good information comes comes out. So I think that was the last slide, unless Roger wants to add something from there. Or Start questions. <laughs> um, before we go to the questions, um, Shelly, you said that you had um, EPA comment. I do, um, and I'll just read what she has sent me. Uh, EPA is pleased with the major accomplishments at the Oak Ridge Reservation. We look forward to celebrating the completion of soil remediation at East Tennessee Technology Park in the near future. Uh, EPA Region 4 is in the process of submitting the DOE Oak Ridge Reservation uh, ETTP for a National EPA Award for Clean Energy Reuse, Climate Change Adaption, and Building Environmental Infrastructure, a Green Economy, and Green Jobs. All right. Thank you, Samantha, for your comment. Thank you, Shelley, for reading it. Um, we will go to the board members first for questions. I just have one question. If I remember correctly, last year, I think you said there's going to be four cells in this new EMDF, but only two would be done at first. 
Yes. So are those other two kind of in reserve for way in the future needs, or do we think we'll need those last two also for the current work? Yeah, I asked a question. I should have covered that. So again, on the, the total capacity that's planned that could be constructed out is 2.2 million cubic yards. Those first two cells we talked about is about one third of the total capacity. But when I talked about the that two thirds and one third was coming from Y12 and OR and L, we actually have a 25% contingency built into that 2.2 meaning. house space because we definitely don't want to have to go through this process right. of having to get approval right. for another one. So, so there is contingency built in there. On the groundwater, the model, is it everything contingent on that? I mean, if what if they come back that groundwater doesn't behave, does it start over? With, how's that? Uh, well, you know, what would have more, you know, if the model was out and water levels were a couple of feet higher than what we would do was redesign the base on the landfill to raise the base of the landfill so that we maintain the 15 feet of separation between the ways so it wouldn't be a, a, a start over it's just simply raised portion, <laughs> portion and part of you know as Dennis just described we have a we have 25 percent contingency in our volume the the challenge is if we raise the the floor of the facility up we lose some of that capacity so we eat into that 25 percent does it mean that the landfill won't be useful? No, it mean it just means that we'll have to we'll be a lot more careful about how we sort segregate and what we put into that landfill and what we try to divert to our sanitary landfills. And in the majority of the location where the landfill is built, the groundwater levels are already at well below that level. Up in the northern part, there's a no where there's recharge in that area. The, the model says that once we cut off that recharge, that the water level will drop down similar to the other area. So, so there's questions into how much it will drop. And so that was why we agreed to, to do this study, just to, to prove the models out all day on that. Um, I think we, is there anybody else in the room that has a question? Because I know we have one online. Is there anybody else in the room? Carol, you, um, it's my understanding that you have a question. I think she said that we've got the sound fixed. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Well, okay. Uh, excellent presentation. I was just wondering about the funding cycle. I know how important EMDF is and the mercury treatment facility. And I also know the DOE budgeting process. And, you know, can you uh, uh, tell us about how that funding cycle looks for the, the balance of the decade? I know we've been hovering around 650 million and whether or not that needs to stay stable or go up or how do you see that funding cycle? So for the construction of the landfill in our budget funding that is out there, it definitely supports completing the construction that I mentioned by the end of this decade of 20, 2029, 2030. Of course, you know, again, everything is conditional on funding. So if that changed, it could impact the schedule and push it out. But for now, the request funding would get us to where we need to be. And we have good support, I can say, for this project. So. Hang on, so that's a good yeah, thing. So, um, Michael, you also have a question online? If the water level test is to be complete this November and run for two years, will this slow the timeline? Uh, no, it's built into our schedule. So again, the, the system will get put in place by the end of November and then we'll monitor the water levels through two wet seasons is, is what the record brought the rod requires us to do and that wet season is considered from December through April. So the first year that we'll monitor is from this December of 2024 through the April of 2025 and we'll, we'll continue to monitor, but then we'll, we have to go through at least another season, which would be uh, December of 2025 to April of 2026. And so that's the two years of data. So the construction date to be done by the end of this. Of this decade takes that into consideration. 
Thank you. Mayor. Um, yeah, again, I remember, I think it was you last year, Roger, that said uh, about funding for this, that there's like a lockbox of funds for this particular project that we don't really have to go begging for more, that it's already there and secured. Hear that correctly? Yeah, this is a uh, Apple in DOE world, there are capital projects and this, this and the outfall 200 project are capital line items and they are the funding in some sense is guaranteed for these. They, it still shows up on our annual budget. You'll see numbers there, but for the most part, these are already funded. And like Dennis said, we have. We have a lot, we have tremendous support from our headquarters, but we also have really good support from our congressions. And they realize that all the other funding for all the other D and D really doesn't amount to anything if we don't have this facility. So it like we have had excellent support from basically everybody in Washington to continue this. Yeah, the annual funding for that is spelled out for for this particular landfill. So I mean, it can't be used for any other work. It's dedicated for that, right? For this as a right. capital line. Do we have any other questions online, Shelley? I do not see any other questions online. No. Okay. Um, we will go to our guest. Um, please indicate by standing if you have a question, or raise your hand if you're on Zoom, um, and wait to be acknowledged. This is questions about the presentation separate from public comment. Yes, I did. I mean, I lose time by public comment or ask questions. <laughs> I'm not going to get you done. Hang on. I'm, this sorry. Question, I'm sorry. Is it questions on Dennis's? Yes, it is. Okay. okay. Just making sure, sir. Yes, it is. On so, landfill 457, um, do you have to file a special waste permit on some of the lots that you send there? That's, uh, that's $300 each time for visual solid waste, isn't it? Yes, that's okay. correct. Um, and the, the scope of this basically is the uh, IFDP, um, you know, you know, projects that got to find around 2010, 2011, right? The buildings that are in that are in, the current, right. in the current scope you're planning for. And you're going to have like uh, maybe four point, uh, you got 2.3 in the EMWF and 2.2 here. So you got about 4.5 million uh, cubic yards, right, to uh, play with. Uh, well, we've already but we've already used almost two million of that. Right. So you got you got, you got the new sale, and, and this this uh, this is all sale in the PC in the PCCR, and uh -huh. when it comes out, yes. Um. So I, I guess they'll probably say that your total circle waste baseline is like three point six three point seven now, isn't it? That is the current estimate. Okay. Um. I think it answers the questions I have. Okay. Thank you, Luther. Okay, we will move on. Um, we will move into our public comment period. Um, Luther, I think that you had sent one uh, a public comment in. Yes, it's because it's in our packet. Is it? Is it a packet? I would like to read it. So, Mr. Olds. Yes, sir. You're. You're. Yes, sir. Okay. Am I recognized? Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Olds. I'm uh, Luther Gibson. I chaired this board in, in 2001 and two, and was there from 1999 to 05. You know, I was a new contractor employee from 1977 to 2017, and we know Prius and Paducah. Um, what I want to say is the topic on ongoing efforts to assure waste disposal capacity should also address access to offsite waste uh, disposal facilities, as well, as well as development of appropriate technologies and disposal options for difficult to dispose of waste, you know, be distorted definitely. Now, now the, the RTGs you mentioned are a good start to that, you know. Um, but due to the time, I will give an example of the offsite concern. A recent renewal of the hazardous waste permit issued by the New Mexico Environment Department for the waste isolation pilot plant incorporated a new requirement to define legacy true and true mixed waste and to develop a legacy true waste disposal plan. Plan intent is to prioritize legacy waste from Los Alamos over other generator sites in the Dewey complex. And this was among a number of other. Uh, provisions that were negotiated with parties opposed to renewal of the permit, including a retired New Mexico regulator who wrote the previous uh, WIP hazardous waste permits. Uh, the, these parties withdrew their opposition when stipulations articulated in the settlement agreement were put into the permit. 
And, and the stipulated permit conditions were then out of bounds to change for comments from other stakeholders uh, during the public involvement of the final draft. Um, the new permit requires DOE to submit an annual report summarizing its progress towards citing another repository for true waste in a state other than New Mexico and threatens a permit revocation process should Congress increase the storage capacity or expand the types of waste accepted at LIP. Um, there are also other conditions that seem in line, given that New Mexico's authority is delegated by EPA under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act for only the chemically hazardous component of mixed waste. Um, although it is indicated that the Legacy True Waste Disposal Plan will, will be developed in consultation with the generator storage sites and, st and stakeholders, this involvement should be approached with a, an assertion or stipulation that existing access to WIP not be changed by this new plan or new waste definitions. Um, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to participating in any local discussion that arises on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Luther. Uh, are there any other public comments in the room or online? If not, we will continue to accept public comment by email through next Tuesday, since Monday is a federal holiday. You may email those to us at the email in the agenda. Okay. Thank you, Shelley. Um, at this time, I will call for additions and motions to approve the agenda. I have a motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Aye. We should have between them. We do have a quorum, don't we? Between yeah. Between those online and the ones in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Let me remind the online folks um, to raise their hand. Okay, I believe that that uh, the motion passes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Motion passes. Sorry. Um, our next meeting will be at 6 p.m. on March 13th to discuss um, the fiscal year 2026 budget input. Um, and as a lot of y'all know, uh, Chris and I will be gone, but we will be chairing from Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it like Leon and I did last year. <laughs> or two years ago, I'm sorry. Um, so we will be with you all that, for that meeting. Um, and that ends our presentation portion of the meeting. If our presenters um, or guests want to leave as we go into our business part, y'all are welcome to. I'll give y'all a couple of minutes for that. Um, otherwise, we'll start business. Um, okay, so has everybody had an opportunity to read the minutes from the last meeting? Okay, all right. Um, I need a motion to approve the minutes from November 8th, 2023. I move as such. I need a second, please. Second. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes as written, say aye or raise your hand online. Yes, online is uh, unanimous. All right, motion carries. Um, are there any responses to the recommendations or DDFO's report? We don't currently have any open recommendations. Uh, I just also want to let people know that the next EM chairs meeting is being planned for uh, Portsmouth, and it's going to be the. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of the uh, first week of May. So we're uh, working on those who want to go to that particular meeting to let us know and we're trying to get set, travel set up. But other than that, I don't have anything else. All right, thank you. Um, committee reports, EM stewardship. Mary, you'll be given that one this evening? Um, yeah, it's up today. Uh, we're completely up to date. There's no outstanding action items. Uh, our next meeting will be two weeks from today, February 28th, and we'll continue the discussion on this topic that we started today. If there is any other questions, and I believe some of the members of the public are part of that committee, so they may have questions as they see the presentation. 
um, but we're good for now. Um, I would ask that anyone who's in the issue group for that topic, it would be me, Dill, Jones, McCurdy, Michael, Sharp, and Tuck, if you can at all, be at all possible, be there at the meeting. Um, but at this point, my understanding is there's no recommendation requested by y'all, so. All right, thank you. Um, are there any additions to the agenda or closing remarks? Y'all don't have any. I can I can tell y'all are not wanting to talk tonight. <laughs> it is valid. <laughs> um, all the members, uh, please remember that we are having a tour on the 27th. Um, be sure to bring your driver's license and either your date of birth or an unexpired passport. Um, and please, please bring your birth certificate or an expired passport. Unexpired. And they don't accept copies of birth certificates or, or photographs. Or photographs on your phone. On your phone. They will not. They want the document, the actual document in hand. Has to have the little seal. Yeah. From little, from the county yeah. government. Yeah. I have a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Motion second to adjourn. All in favor, say aye or raise your hand online. Okay. It's online. We're good. Motion to adjourn. We're, we're adjourned.